the Bankai transformation has cemented itself as one of the greatest power-ups within all of shonen anime and manga. The significance of a Bankai form goes beyond their stunning design as they serve as profound indicators of a character's evolution. Kubo works so hard to craft a particular Bankai to match the character's personality as well as the development of that character in particular, and it is almost impossible to analyse one of the Shinigami without factoring in details from their Bankai. In most cases, when a Bankai is activated it can turn the tide of battle in the favour of the Shinigami. This transformation makes an unforgettably powerful statement on the battlefield. There are some Bankai transformations which genuinely feel like one of the most disrespectful flexes in all of fiction. Despite the Bankai form being such an iconic aspect of the Bleach series, debates have been rampant amongst fans all over the internet on web forums, arguing about why one particular Bankai is more powerful than the other. So while I have analysed almost every single Bankai on my channel, I've yet to make a full complete Bankai ranking video, and I think that the timing is perfect with Core 2 having wrapped up and with us getting several new Bankai reveals within the anime, my plan is to go in depth in one of my most comprehensive ranking lists of every single Bankai that's ever been revealed within Bleach. This is definitely a video that you want to stick around to the very end as I'll be speaking about some of the most powerful and broken Bankai that we've seen within Bleach. So without further delay, here is my video ranking every single Bankai from the weakest to the very strongest. Before beginning the ranking, let's lay down some ground rules, as I'll explain my metric for ranking certain Bankai. I've compiled this ranking after placing priority upon two key points. The first is the amount of Reatsu that is possessed by the Shinigami, and the second is the actual abilities that the Bankai brings to the table. So by combining these two metrics, it should make it quite easy to go over every single Bankai. Now when I speak about any given Bankai, I'll explain why they have received this ranking in full detail. So don't go rushing to the comments until you've heard all of my explanation as to why a certain Bankai is ranked higher or lower than another. And also, just to clarify, this ranking list is also going to include different iterations of a certain Bankai, specifically false and true Bankai. So individuals like Ichigo and Renji's false and true Bankais will be on this list. Now with the paperwork out of the way, let's start with number 30, which I believe to be the worst Bankai in the entire Bleach universe. Coming in at number 30 and unfortunately earning the title for the worst Bankai is unfortunately going to have to be Ikaku Madarame's Ryumon Hazokimaru. I really hate to do this to one of my favourite 11th Division members, but the truth really needs to come out. Despite having what is indisputably one of the coldest Bankai designs and reveals of all time, Ryumon Hazokimaru fails in a number of aspects. It neither grants Ikaku any special abilities, nor does it enhance any of his physical attributes. This Bankai increases the weapon's destructive power, meaning that Ikaku doesn't get any stronger, he only gets a stronger weapon in return for activating his second release. A large, oversized, bulky weapon that a skilled opponent would easily be able to sidestep and counter with their very own attack which Ikaku would struggle to avoid. Because his Bankai consists of massive blades, it is difficult for Ikaku to land any attack on his opponent in comparison to a Bankai like Senbon Zakura which can be used to attack a target effortlessly, with Byakuya exerting minimal effort by moving his hands and directing the petals towards the target. Because of the bulky nature of Ikaku's Bankai, it negates the effect of this power-up. Now considering the fact that Ikaku is a highly skilled swordsman, you may think that he could rely on his formidable blades for defence. However, a massive flaw emerges. Now the blades are oddly fragile as they shatter under any significant impact. This means that Ikaku has to effectively choose between taking attacks directly onto his own body or blocking them with his Zanpakuto, which risks him breaking his Bankai permanently, as Mayuri explains during the Thousand Year Blood War arc that any damage done to a Bankai is irreparable. Now this had already happened when Ikaku had faced off with one of the Arankas during the invasion of Karakura Town. His already pretty weak Bankai is now described as a shadow of its former self after all of the damage that it had sustained. Now let this sink in for just a second. Not even Akon's miraculous flex tape could save this Bankai. Now at this point, the only way for Ikaku to 
redeem himself is to visit the royal palace and have his Zanpakuto reforged by Oetsu Nimaya. But this seems like a very unlikely prospect and something that I don't think will ever happen. Now despite having said all of this, this isn't even going into the proper weaknesses of Ryuma and Hozokimaru. You may be thinking, despite its defensive vulnerabilities, Ikaku could just harness its raw power in order to dominate his opponents. Unfortunately, even when it comes to its offensive properties, his Bankai is even further limited because it doesn't start out at full power and it only gradually raises its Reiatsu to its full strength as a battle progresses, which means that he cannot even gain access to his full power right off of the bat, which is comically bad. There is literally no point for Ikaku to even ever activate his Bankai at all. However, there is still a glimmer of hope as Ikaku can speed up the Reiatsu buildup by rotating the blades by using the middle one as a pivot. But even after he reaches the point of full power and he launches an attack, pretty much most of the skilled combatants within Bleach will be able to avoid his attack, which would then leave Ikaku open to a direct counter-attack, which would land square in his shiny bald head. Yeah, unfortunately, Ikaku's Bankai just isn't it. Now, let's move on to the 29th Bankai on this list, which is unfortunately none other than Hihio Zabimaru. I apologize to the two Renji fans out there, but there is a plethora of reasons as to why this Bankai is one of the weakest in the series. Ignoring the fact that it's an incomplete Bankai, because other characters like Ichigo and Hitsugaya both had incomplete Bankai, but they were still able to pull off some cool feats, it leaves very little excuse for Hihio Zabimaru which pales in comparison. Unsurprisingly, the design of this Bankai is incredible, which is to be expected from Tight Kubo. Now in comparison to Ikaku's Bankai, Hihio Zabimaru isn't really a bad Bankai, at least not as bad as Ikaku's Bankai. It grants Renji much more reach and raw destructive power than his Shikai alone, and unlike Ryumon Hizokimaru, it doesn't need to gradually build up to its full power. It's ready to go immediately after Bankai activation. Renji's false Bankai expands upon his arsenal of attacks by adding on some very versatile moves like Higa Zeko, which compensates for the Bankai's somewhat cumbersome nature. Another notable addition to his moveset from this Bankai is the devastating Hikotsu Taiho attack. This Reatsu binding ability once again gives Renji a bit of versatility in his fights. But unfortunately, this is the end of all of the positive things that I can say about Hihio Zabimaru. Now, the main problem of this transformation goes beyond the Bankai form and it extends to Renji as an individual. The problem is that Renji is a bit too weak at this point in the story to even have a Bankai. As a result, he's up against individuals who are more stronger than him and consequently, they can smash his Bankai to pieces with minimal effort. He simply is too low on his Reiatsu scale in order to use such a powerful Bankai to its full potential. So instead of Renji having this massive weapon that can threaten his opponents, it ends up being a easy target for opponents to neutralize him by disarming him. And this doesn't even factor in all of the technical difficulties that would arise from Renji wielding such an impractically large weapon. I've decided not to delve into the difficulty that Renji would have controlling Hihio Zabimaru, because it is mostly a skill issue which Renji overcomes after he uses his Bankai for the first time against Byakuya. So for all of the reasons stated, Hihio Zabimaru earns its spot as the second worst Bankai in Bleach. Now let's move on to number 28, which spoiler alert is going to be the first controversial decision of this video. The next Bankai is Shinji Hirako's Sakashima Yokoshima Hapo Fusagari. Before rage quitting this video, hear me out. Shinji's Bankai is a really fascinating one. Its unique ability to switch an enemy's perception of ally and adversary can be game changing in certain battles. But that's where all the good points about this Bankai really end. Because now that you're left with a Bankai that is 100% useless in one on one battles, effectively, it's a Bankai that lacks utility. Even in group situations, its success isn't guaranteed due to potential counters like Reatsu negation. Consider the hypothetical situation if he were to find himself battling against Yuhobak and Aizen, who for some reason are working together. On the off chance that Shinji were to use his Bankai on them, and it wasn't negated by Yuhobak or Aizen in any way, then he would still have a lot of difficulty, because his Bankai doesn't guarantee a fortunate outcome for him. Firstly, let's consider how his Bankai ability is depicted within the Bleach canon. The first time that we see his Bankai is within the Can't Be Your Own World light novels, where Shinji uses it against the creatures that have been spawned by Iko Mikidomoe. These creatures were essentially clones of each other and as a result had no animosity towards each other, but only towards the Shinigami that they were created to kill. Which is why Shinji's Bankai ends up being so effective against them. Because of their extremely strong notions of friend and foe, he is able to successfully 
turn the tide of battle. A similar situation had arised within the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime where he had used his Bankai against the Soldat and a similar outcome had occurred. Now let's take this back to the hypothetical situation of Yuhobak and Aizen teaming up against him. Neither of these two characters have extremely strong conceptions of friend or foe. They are not really loyal to anyone nor do they hold their allies or underlings in high regard and since Shinji's Bankai only switches perceptions and it doesn't create them it would mean that even if Shinji is able to switch their perception of friend and foe it wouldn't stop Yuhobak or Aizen from still killing him since both of them have little consideration for friend or foe and this is especially the case for Yuhobak. The main problem of Shinji's Bankai is that it won't have much effect on an enemy who's naturally treacherous or doesn't have a strong distinction between friend or foe. It's not like the book of the end that can turn enemies into your most loyal followers so it can't make enemies feel what they don't have the capacity to feel. So you'd be basically changing treacherous enemies who have made up their minds to kill you into allies who are still treacherous and would more than likely still betray you by killing you. Shinji has several abilities in his moveset and he could most likely deal with most opponents with just a Saro alone. Meaning that Shinji's Bankai only really has use against enemies who outnumber him and are relative to him in power. This means that his Bankai activation is limited to rare situations so it may as well be useless. There's also the fact that its power works indiscriminately and it will even affect Shinji's allies if they are within range. So this gives him even less incentive to use it. This is part of the reason why it had taken us so long to actually see his Bankai. It's an extremely inconvenient transformation that is only effective in a handful of situations. Even Shinji alludes to the inversion that exists within his Shika and his Bankai, stating that his Bankai is effective against small fries while his Shikai is effective against giants. This is a total inversion of what Bankai and Shikai typically are. His Bankai is best suited for dealing with fodder with minimal effort which is supposed to be the point. So despite how incredibly cool it is, it's unfortunately a Bankai that is way too situational and it relies too heavily on this idea of inversion that is heavily linked to Shinji's character. Which results in Shinji's Shikai behaving more like a Bankai and his Bankai behaving more like a Shikai. Next up we have the Bankai of Soifon called Jakuho Raikoben. Don't get me wrong, this is an incredibly cool Bankai with lots of thought that has been put into its design but unfortunately even something as powerful as a straight up nuke doesn't hold up to the variety and scale of power that is possessed by some of the other Bankai. Jakuho Raikoben is a Bankai that manifests as a giant missile that Soifon can fire at any enemy. It creates a fairly large explosion so it's also very good for crowd control when fighting a large number of opponents. The first problem with this Bankai is its extremely limited usability. Originally Soifon could only really fire off a single missile once every three days. It's a pretty strange limitation that we haven't seen up until now but thankfully she does learn to use her Bankai more than once a day and its upper limit remains untested but while she was battling against Barragan she was able to use it for a second time just a couple of hours after the first time. Now it's unlikely that her Bankai ability has grown by any noticeable degree since then which is why it is ranked so low down on this list. Another issue that I have with her Bankai lies in how simplistic its attack style is. While it does make for an explosive impact but in the end there is nothing more to it. It's just a missile. This would have been fine if this was any other shonen battle manga but Bleach characters are known for being extremely fast so they would be able to easily put up a defense against her attack or simply just move out of the way. Characters with long range attacks are even able to detonate Soifon's missile even before it gets close to them. Then you have powerful characters who would be able to withstand their explosions without significant harm because of Soifon's relatively low Reatsu. So in the end Soifon has a Bankai that she can barely use and also has a rather low chance of success when she does use it. It's a Bankai that just doesn't work outside of situations where an enemy is entrapped or in a position where they cannot escape like Barragan was or like when BG9 was paralyzed by Holo Reatsu. Overall it makes a Bankai extremely unreliable and this is why it's ranked number 27 in this list. Coming in at the fifth worst Bankai on this list is Komomura's Kokujo Tengen Myo. Now as a reminder most of these Bankai that I'm speaking about are perfectly fine as power-ups but when it comes to Bankai just being good is not good enough. Kokujo Tengen Myo is a Bankai that manifests a giant samurai avatar that fights alongside its master Komomura. It boasts ridiculous offensive and defensive capabilities and it has even earned admiration from opponents for its formidable destructive capabilities. So while there is a 
lot to praise about the offense and defense of this Bankai. This is where the pros of this transformation pretty much end, because this form comes with quite a few limitations. Unlike some of the other Bankai, Kokujo Tengen Mio doesn't unleash lightning fast sword beams, nor does it possess any ridiculous hacks that help Komamura in battle. It's simply a gigantic avatar wielding a massive sword, which lets Komamura layeth the smacketh down whenever he needs to. In order for this Bankai to be effective, the attacks need to make contact, but this is where complications arise. You could argue that the enormous shockwaves that are generated by the large sword are a force to be reckoned with, but in comparison to a direct sword hit, these shockwaves are less potent. So if Komomura is up against an opponent who can dodge or block his regular attacks, then the shockwaves generated by the sword are unlikely to harm them. All of this is made worse by the fact that Komomura is one of the slowest captains in the Gotei 13. He has a speed rating of 40 out of 100, and this is from Kubo himself from the Bleach data books. So having a Bankai mostly reliant on his ability to nail targets would be problematic for one of the slowest captains, who is essentially up against characters who can move faster than the speed of light. Now don't worry, things get even worse from here, because Komomura's bond with his Zanbakdo is unique. Any injuries that are sustained by the Bankai avatar are mirrored onto Komomura. This pretty much reduces his defensive stats by almost 90%. The avatar has significantly higher defensive capability than Komomura himself. This advantage is outweighed by the repercussions of any damage that has been sustained to this oversized target. The silver lining to all of this is that if Komomura heals himself, then his Bankai also heals. So while being able to bypass the irreparability of Bankai damage, this is only useful if Komomura ends up surviving the battle in the first place. So in summary, Komomura is not only left with a big slow avatar that can barely hit anything, he needs to then worry about making contact with any of his hits, while at the same time avoiding any attacks from his opponent, because any wounds sustained by his avatar are reflected back onto his own body. This ultimately means that Kokujo Tengen Mio is only useful against fighting large numbers of fodder opponents, who would easily be able to be taken out by the massive shockwaves generated from his sword. I think the moral of this Bankai is that there is no point in having great strength if you're unable to hit anything, and there's no point in having a formidable shield if it cannot withstand attacks. The number 25 Bankai on this list belongs to Kensei Mugurama's explosive Bankai Taken Tachikaze. It's a really well-designed Bankai which draws heavy inspiration from Buddhist themes. This results in an interesting inversion, where these peaceful themes are fashioned into an aggressive power-up. This Bankai takes up the form of double gauntlets with extensions that form an arc over his shoulders and above his head. What's unique about this Bankai is its ability to unleash indefinite explosions within any object upon making contact with the knuckles of its gauntlets. In simpler terms, wherever the gauntlet's knuckles touch, Tekken Tachikaze can initiate consecutive internal detonations. It's a deadly power that is made even more frightening thanks to Kensei being a master hand-to-hand -hand combatant, which means that he would have no problem with hitting his targets. There's also the fact that due to his access to hollow powers, his natural speed and agility will gain a massive power buff, so he'll be able to keep up with any opponents who also have high agility and speed. The nature of Tekken Tachikaze's abilities granted a certain degree of durability negation, due to the fact that its explosions bypass whatever external defense an enemy may have as it deals most of its damage within their body where they are significantly more vulnerable. In all honesty, it's a very powerful Bankai that would rank higher if most other Bankai weren't as incredibly broken as this one was. It's difficult to imagine how any of the Bankai which are ranked below this one would fare against it, but this doesn't mean that Tekken Tachikaze doesn't have weaknesses. Despite it being quite a strong ability, it is at the end of the day possessed by a low to mid tier captain. This means that its explosions may work against weaker opponents, but they wouldn't do much damage against a stronger, more formidable opponent. Even if its attacks were effective against his opponent, the entire ability of his Bankai relies on the fact that he needs to make contact with his target. This does become a major problem when he has to deal with an opponent who is faster than him. Like I've mentioned earlier on, several Bleach characters possess notable speed, which is a problem for this particular Bankai. So while Tekken Tachikaze is an impressive Bankai, at the end of the day it's only going to get Kensei so far. The next Bankai in the 24th spot is none other than Rose's Kinshara Butodan. The dance trope of death boasts a power that is rare not just in Bleach, but possibly in all of anime. His Bankai manifests golden humanoid figures. They play music in accordance with their conductor's command. Now these creatures don't just make music, they are able to bring to life the very essence of the music 
music itself. This brings a totally new meaning to the saying, you can't touch music but music can touch you. The music of Kinshara Bitoden materializes whatever theme that the golden figures are playing, giving this Bankai an unmatched level of versatility that goes beyond the limits of a regular Bankai. This Bankai is capable of manifesting abilities that have different elemental attributes like fire and water which is supposed to be impossible to do for any Zanpakuto. Now this very ability does however come with a catch. We quickly learn that the true power of Kinshara Bitoden is essentially an illusion. The music created by the Golden Dance troupe manifests an auditory illusion which tricks a given target into believing that whatever they are seeing and feeling is real. If they are convinced that they are drowning or being incinerated, then their mind will trick them into experiencing that very sensation. Frighteningly, this Bankai possesses the chilling ability to serenade you to your death. Well, this is what should have happened when this Bankai was utilized within the story, but we all know how Kinshara Bitoden had turned out. This Bankai has probably one of the most obvious weaknesses in the entire series. Because of its power relying on sound, it needs the opponent to be within hearing distance of Kinshara Bitoden's music. Or if you're like Mask the Masculine, you can burst your eardrums. Or like Piccolo in Movie 4 Lord Slug, you can rip your ears off. So his Bankai is ineffective against people who can't hear it. This means that enemies who are comfortable with fighting long range battles like Lil Barrow would be pretty much unfazed by this Bankai. Similar to Kente's Bankai, this is another one that is wielded by a mid to low tier captain. So its full effects are limited to some degree because of the amount of Reatsu that is possessed by Rose. Now normally I wouldn't factor in weaknesses which are associated with a user's personality, but I feel that this needs to be stated. Kinshara Bitoden is owned by probably one of the most dramatic and pretentious Shinigami in existence, which results in Rose literally explaining the nature of his Bankai to his opponents and basically dropping obvious hints to them on how best to counter him, all because he prioritizes style over strategy. I'm just never going to get over how he was defeated by Mask. It was just really funny and tragic at the same time. So let's try to distract ourselves with the next Bankai on the list, which just so happens to be the perfect Bankai to counter Kinshara Bitoden. The next Bankai is a bit of an underrated one. This doesn't mean that it's any better than the ones that are ranked higher than it, it's just that it's often overlooked by fans. I am of course talking about Kaname Tozen's Suzumushi Suishiki Enma Korogi. This Bankai crafts a dark realm which immerses its target into an abyss which is devoid of both light and sound. It's like a massive sensory deprivation tank. All of an individual's senses are robbed from them aside from their sense of touch. Now this of course includes spiritual senses. It's a Bankai that is so broken that it's difficult to imagine how you would lose while wielding it. Now if Tozen didn't waste so much time monologuing and just decided to finish off his opponents, he probably would have had more success with this Bankai. While this is a powerful Bankai worthy of praise, it also possesses a weakness that is similar to Aizen's Kyokasu Getsu. Whereas Kyokasu Getsu's deadly illusions can be avoided by touching the blade before its Shikai is released, in order to overcome Tozen's Bankai ability, his opponent needs to touch the hilt of his Zanbakdo in order to be granted immunity against his Bankai's darkness. This is because the hilt of Tozen Zanbakdo serves as a safe zone, which ensures that the wielder of the Zanbakdo is not affected by the Bankai's abilities. The major disadvantage is that this protection also extends to anyone else who touches Suzumushi. This of course is the only way that Tozen's opponents can regain their senses after he uses his Bankai on them. Now of course this is easier said than done as the outcome largely hinges on Tozen's resolve in battle. While his Bankai is undeniably powerful, there is still a fair number of Bankai that rank above this one in our list. Taking the 22nd position in our ranking list is none other than the icy Bankai Daigurin Hyorin Maru, which of course belongs to the prodigy himself Toshiro Hitsugaya. This is a very interesting Bankai, firstly due to the fact that it's actually immature, but even this doesn't stop it from exhibiting the levels of power that it shows throughout the story. Daigurin Hyorin Maru is more than just an ice creating weapon. It grants Hitsugaya the ability to both create and control ice. This Bankai has both basic and advanced abilities. On one hand, it can generate vast city sized volumes of ice in mere seconds, as well as being able to form intricate structures from the ice. This Bankai can also change the weather and manipulate atmospheric moisture. It's undoubtedly a formidable Bankai, but it's often held back by its young and inexperienced wielder. Despite having no actual weaknesses outside of extreme heat, why isn't this Bankai ranked a bit higher in the list? It's like I just said, it's because 
Daiguren Hyorin Maru suffers from being a great weapon which is in the hands of a literal child. A lot of its abilities would have been far more effective if Hitsugaya was simply just a bit more experienced. His inexperience in mastering the full scope of his Zanpakuto's powers hold him back in several ways. He is unable to perform certain techniques when he needs to and he literally needs to wait out a timer of unspecified length before he can gain full access to his Bankai's power. This is a trait that is shared with Ikaku's Bankai who once again is another inexperienced wielder of a Bankai. Hitsugaya's limitations have cost him several battles in the series. In addition to his lack of experience, he also lacks power which holds his Bankai back too. Despite the fact that Hitsugaya has Captain Class Reatsu, he unfortunately is placed on the lower end of the power spectrum and he is often perceived as the little brother of the Gotei 13. This in fact nerfs the effectiveness of his powers by a massive degree, which makes a lot of his attacks lack the full impact that they should have against certain opponents. This creates a massive difference between the potential of his abilities in theory and their actual effectiveness in battle. In the end, you even have some opponents who are able to effortlessly counter some of Hitsugaya's most mightiest attacks. This Bankai falls under a very unique predicament where it's a genuinely fantastic power-up which is held back by the inexperience of its owner who despite everything is still one of the youngest Shinigami to have ever attained the captain rank and hopefully with enough time and a growth spurt, Hitsugaya's Bankai may rank higher on this list. The next Bankai may well be a controversial choice but I ask that you hear me out. In the 21st spot we have Mayuri's Konjigi Ashisogi Jizo. Being the first Bankai that we see in the story, it's a bit disappointing to see it ranked so low on this list. But let's delve into the reasons why. There's no denying that Konjigi Ashisogi Jizo is visually captivating. It takes up the form of a colossal creature which resembles a fusion of a butterfly, baby and a caterpillar. While it has a mind-boggling appearance, thankfully its powers are a bit more simpler to understand. This Bankai can release a potent toxic miasma which swiftly poisons anyone within a 200 meter radius around it. Its primary strength lies in this fast acting poison. This massive butterfly baby caterpillar creature does have another ability as it is able to manifest a bunch of blades from its body which it can use to impale its targets. Of course this isn't as impressive as its ability to poison others. The only reason that this Bankai has ranked so high on this list is because of the Bankai that are ranked below it not being able to counter this Bankai's ability to poison an area of 200 meters surrounding the giant baby. Despite having this very unique power, the giant baby-like creature can be obliterated if Mayuri is facing off against an opponent who is able to harness enough power to destroy it. Because of the fast-acting nature of the poison, by the time that his opponent has enough power and they fire the attack which destroys Mayuri and his Bankai, they will have most likely already succumbed to his Bankai's poison. Konjigi Ashisogi Jizo is a Bankai that has only one really broken basic ability. Now while we are on the subject of poison themed Bankai, there's another one that might just surpass Mayuri's ineffectiveness and it just so happens to be the next Bankai which has earned the 20th spot on this list and it's none other than Kamishini no Yari, the Lance of Deicide. I initially struggled with where I would rank this Bankai on this list but after thorough consideration I believe that it's been rightly positioned here. This Bankai had belonged to the treacherous but tragic figure Ginichimaru. Kamishini no Yari is an incredibly powerful Bankai with the unique ability to stretch its blade over vast distances at breathtaking speeds. It's difficult for me to give you specifics on how fast his Zanpakuto moves because Gin lies more than a politician. This is a Bankai that can extend across large areas. The sword can literally extend across the length of a city. While this in itself is impressive, the true threat lies in the speed of its extension. Gin's Bankai moves so rapidly that anyone in its trajectory faces near certain doom. The mystery behind why it can stretch so quickly is that the blade dematerializes into dust momentarily only for it to then instantly rematerialize into its bladed form. Despite this, its greatest and deadliest power lies in the fact that when it is in its dematerialized state, it can leave fragments of itself inside any opponent that is stabbed by the Zanbakdo. Initially appearing to be a simple extending Zanbakdo, it reveals its lethal nature when this fragment morphs into a potent poison, which quickly destroys an enemy's body from within by destroying body tissue on a cellular level. This very ability almost kills Aizen while he is in his transcendent Hokyoku form. I don't need to explain to you how much of a massive feat this is, considering that most of the characters at this time couldn't even perceive Aizen's power, let alone deal this much damage to him. Taking this into consideration, why 
why is it that Kamishini no Yari ranks so low on this list? I think that it's very misleading to equate Kamishini no Yari's power directly to that of Transcendent Aizen. Even Gin had conceded his inferiority to the base form of Aizen. Ordinarily, Aizen wouldn't have been affected by Kamishini no Yari if he hadn't become extremely careless because of his overconfidence in the power of the Hokyoku. This is further supported by the fact that Gin never attempted to do this when Aizen was still just a ordinary Shinigami, because he was far more careful back then. Additionally, at this point, Aizen had purposefully reduced his Reiatsu in order to avoid instantly killing Ichigo's friends who were near him, because he wanted to torment them. It was a combination of all of these factors at play that had convinced Gin that it was the perfect time to make his move. So it is hard for us to measure the power of Gin's Bankai based solely on how effective it was against Aizen. In the end, we're left with a Bankai which was possessed by an extremely skilled swordsman, which is able to expand and retract at speeds that are faster than the eye can keep up with. Even if he is up against an opponent who has been impaled several times and they are still standing, he can then simply release the cell-destroying poison into their body, which will definitely finish off the job. Don't get me wrong, I think that this is still a very powerful Bankai, and I don't think that anything is limiting it in particular, aside from the fact that I believe that the Bankai that are ranked above this one possess even greater power than it. The next Bankai needs no introduction as it's wielded by the iconic Chojuro Sasakibe, who, if you didn't know, was responsible for landing the final blow which defeated Yuhobak over 1,000 years ago. His Bankai, Koko Gonryo Rikyu, was only briefly shown to us within the manga when Driscoll Bursi had embarrassingly used it. From Yamamoto's reaction, we are aware that his utilization of this Bankai was nowhere near its full potential. Thankfully, during Core 1 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, we received anime exclusive scenes, which took us back in time to Sasakibe demonstrating his incredible Bankai to Yamamoto. Within the manga, it is clear that this Bankai can manipulate lightning as well as the weather, which makes it one of the very few Bankai which can manipulate weather phenomenon. It is also ranked amongst the very few abilities which have ever left a mark on the body of Prime Yamamoto. This feat alone, in my opinion, absolutely earns it this spot in this ranking list. Thankfully, because of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, there's so many new details for us to uncover about this particular transformation. Not only do we see Sasakibe utilize its power, we also get an idea of what this Bankai can do. One of the most important details that we learn about his Bankai via these anime scenes is that his Bankai can be used to propel Sasakibe's attacks, allowing him to attack and pierce with the combined speed and power of a lightning bolt. While this may not sound as groundbreaking as some of the other abilities in the series, when you consider the fact that this was enough to injure Prime Yamamoto proves that the significance of this Bankai form is undeniable. While I would have loved to rank it higher, this is unfortunately all that this Bankai has going for it. I would have loved for more details to have been revealed to us, but from everything that we know, it well and truly deserves the 19th spot on this list. Claiming the 18th spot of the most powerful Bankai is one that many of you may not be aware of because it is a light novel exclusive Bankai. It's none other than the Bankai of Kimpachi Kuriyashiki. It is called Gagaku Kairo. This power-up has earned the reputation of being so unbelievably powerful that it was in fact banned from ever being used within the Soul Society. It's important to clarify, just because it was banned doesn't necessarily mean that it's really powerful. There are other Bankai that warrant being banned from the Soul Society, like Shinji's Bankai. This is because of the indiscriminate nature of a Bankai's power. Because there is a risk of collateral damage if such a Bankai is activated near allies. Now, Gagaku Kairo is banned for a relatively different reason. It was forbidden because it destroys things on a really massive scale, so huge that it threatens the very Soul Society itself. Now, how does it do this? Well, it uses a complex series of highly destructive fangs, which manifest as a gigantic mouth which swallows the entire area, devouring both living and non-living things, as this Bankai indiscriminately eats absolutely everything, aside from Kuriyashiki himself. It's really difficult to imagine just how this would look or even the speed at which this takes place due to the lack of material visually representing this Bankai because it's a light novel exclusive one. I mean, we do get an animation of it from Brave Souls, but it doesn't really do it justice. Thankfully, we do have enough testimonials from characters and in-universe lore drops which suggest that its speed poses a threat to even fast characters like top-tier captains. When you combine this with the fact that Kimpachi Kuriyashiki himself was invited to join the Zero Division, it further emphasizes just how strong he was, which gives more credibility to the broken nature of his Bankai. You may be thinking that possessing such a powerful Bankai must come with a catch. Well, let's just say that Gagaku Kairo actually comes with one of the most daunting 
drawbacks in the series. Upon its activation, it requires a cooldown, not only just for a few hours or days, but an astounding 6 months. This is made worse because he doesn't just lose his Bankai for 6 months, the entire moveset of his Zanpakuto, including its Shikai, become unavailable to him. This means that for the price of one massive show of power, Kuriyashiki has to pay an equally absurd price for it. Now imagine if he was alive during the Soul Society arc, he would have probably ended up utilizing his Bankai against Aizen, and then he would have ended up having no Zanpakuto powers for the length of the entire Aranka arc. He would be pretty much wasted as a captain if he can't use his Shikai or his Bankai during one of the most pivotal, battle-heavy portions of the story. Despite all of this, there's a lot to commend Kuriya Shiki for, because how on earth was he able to survive as a Kimpachi for so long without relying on his Bankai? If anything, it's a testament to how powerful Kuriya Shiki is naturally. Now given the severe repercussions for utilizing this Bankai, it is evident why Gagaku Kairo isn't ranked any higher on this list. The price for utilizing this power is simply too harsh in my opinion. Speaking of Bankai that are unfairly punishing to use, our next Bankai falls under the exact same umbrella. This Bankai belongs to the extremely loyal captain Seijin Komomura, and during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, his Bankai actually evolves to a new version called Dangai Jo. This Bankai is definitely the easiest to explain, considering that we've already gone over his previous iteration, Kokujo Tengen Myo. Thankfully, this makes it a bit easier to understand Kokujo Tengen Myo Dangai Jo. So it basically possesses all of the strengths of the previous iteration, but absolutely none of its weaknesses. It is just a flat out upgrade over the entire Bankai. But before I dive into its details, let's clarify why it's included here separately on this list. Now you might question why this is treated as a Bankai variant, since it's not strictly a Bankai evolution, but more of a result of his clan's secret technique, the humanization technique. Because of the humanization technique, it modifies Komamura's Bankai into a different state setting it apart from the original version. This transformation coupled with the distinct naming justifies its classification as a separate iteration of his Bankai, especially given the significance of names within Bleach. I'm sure if any of you were to ask Ichibei Yosube, then he would tell you flat out that this is a different iteration of Komamura's old Bankai. So in terms of its capabilities, like I've mentioned, Dangai Jo surpasses its predecessor in every aspect. Where the old Kokujo Tengen Mule was characterized by sluggish motions, Dangai Jo exhibits unprecedented agility, enabling feats like leaping strikes and even outpacing formidable opponents like Bambietta in a holy form. Another major weakness of this Bankai which has been corrected in this version is the fact that any damage sustained by the avatar is not reflected back to Komomura. Komomura effectively has temporary immortality due to the humanization technique. Now this trait extends even to his colossal Bankai avatar, so neither of them are a liability in battle. Now this is where I would usually start talking about how this opens up the opportunity for interesting strategies in battle, but unfortunately this cannot happen with Dangai Jo because this Bankai is restricted to a singular use. The massive drawback of Dangai Jo is its limited activation span. This Bankai cannot be activated and deactivated at will. It can only be used by a member of Komomura's clan for a couple of hours at most. So unfortunately when time runs out the repercussions are dire. Anyone who uses this ability completely loses their sense of reason and they become a wild animal. Meaning that if Komomura isn't able to get the job done and defeat his opponent, then he'll simply be transformed into an ordinary wolf who would be very vulnerable to attack from the enemy. While Dangai Jo boasts impressive power, its associated risks are monumental. So it's ranked in the 17th position because it outclasses any Bankai ranked below it, but because of its drawbacks, I'd hesitate to rank it any higher than this. Next up, we have the true Bankai of Renji Abarai, So'o Zabimaru. Renji's true Bankai is another Bankai evolution that takes everything wrong with the old iteration, which let's be honest was absolutely everything, and it throws it all into the trash and then proceeds to replace it with something infinitely better. Now this Bankai does everything right, starting from the most basic and technical level, which is the fact that it completely does away with the unwieldy and clunky form of Hihio Zabimaru and instead opts for something much sleeker and more versatile. It manifests mainly as a massive ape like arm extension which exists above Renji's own left arm. The arm is shown to be immensely strong as it's capable of effortlessly capturing and crushing the bones of a powerful Sternritter like Mask D Masculine. It's also really cool looking and I'm really hoping that we get to see more of it via some anime exclusive scenes in the Thousand Year Blood War arc or even in the upcoming manga Hell arc. The second key component of this Bankai is the snake-like
like blade that accompanies the giant ape arm. Undeniably, it is mysterious in how it works, but aside from being a very lethal sword, it can be used to summon a massive snake avatar that can incinerate enemies inside of a single bite, via a technique that Renji calls Zaga Teppo. With the evolved version of his Bankai, Renji has increased physical capabilities. His strength, speed, and overall durability all gain a massive buff. This makes it much more challenging for enemies to actually harm him, unlike with his old Bankai, where they were able to easily ignore the oversized Hihio Zabimaru in order to attack Renji himself. Admittedly, because of its brief appearance, it's a challenge to contrast the versatility of So'o Zabimaru in comparison to Hihio Zabimaru. But the more time that is spent comparing these two Bankai forms, then it becomes even clearer that the older version of Renji's Bankai is unable to achieve some of the feats that his all new evolved true Bankai can. Why settle for Hihio Zabimaru, which is essentially a segmented blade when you can have a colossal arm that offers a more straightforward, effective approach? So O Zabimaru can flat out overpower or outlast any of the Bankai that are ranked below it. Overall, it's the perfect Bankai, and unfortunately, I can't bump it up any higher because from here on out, things are about to get serious as we're turning our attention towards the more powerful Bankai in the series. Ranking in at number 15, we have Konjigi Ashisogi Jizo Matai Fukuen Shotai. It's undeniable that Mayuri needed a Bankai enhancement. While his original Bankai, Konjigi Ashisogi Jizo, is undeniably deadly with its poison mist ability, which like I mentioned earlier is the only real thing going for Mayuri's original Bankai. The evolved version, similar to the previous iteration, manifests a giant baby upon activation. But this time, the giant baby is actually purple and it looks less nightmarish than the original. Now, if a giant purple humanoid baby wasn't disturbing enough, it also gives birth to another giant baby whose abilities are defined by the individual that Mayuri is facing off against in battle. So simply put, the second giant baby possesses capabilities that perfectly counteract those of his opponent. So how does this work? Well, his Bankai is able to achieve this based on the information that Mayuri gives it during battle. So essentially, the success of the counter created by this Bankai relies entirely on Mayuri's ability to fully comprehend the full scope of his opponent's powers, and he has to relay this information to his Zanpakuto perfectly. This power combined with the intellect of Mayuri appears to be a formidable combination. But despite Mayuri's high intellect, the limitations of this power become apparent very quickly. The first limitation of Matai Fukuen Shotai is its dependency on witnessing the opponent's capabilities firsthand. The challenge here is that Mayuri needs to survive the initial attack. Despite how strong Mayuri may come across, he's easily one of the physically weakest captains, if not the weakest. In the face of overwhelming power, he will most definitely get taken down before he has a chance to even counterattack. Meaning that if God forbid he faces an extremely strong enemy with an ability he can't avoid or do anything against, Mayuri would flat out die before being able to relay any information to his Zanpakuto. This completely cripples Mayuri's chances of using this incredibly strong ability, because surviving the power of an unknown ability will be much more than he can actually handle. For example, let's say he hypothetically had fought a character like Lil Barrow or even Hashward. What would he do to survive any of their initial attacks in order to gain any information from them? I don't see it playing out very well for him, and that's exactly my point. He needs to experience the powers of his opponents before beginning to create a cure to them, which is a risk that he cannot afford to take with some of the individuals in Bleach. The second limitation occurs when he crafts a counter to his opponent's abilities. The entity that he manifests is singularly designed for that one purpose, without anticipating potential additional powers that his opponent may utilize in the future. This shortcoming became painfully obvious during Myri's battle against Pernida. The creature that Myri had manifested to neutralize Pernida's deadly nerves was unsuccessful because Pernida had unleashed a previously unseen ability, which was Pernida's basic power to make Quincy arrows. This weakness ties into the first one, which is the fact that Myri can't prepare for an ability that he's had no experience against, which results in any of his countermeasures failing. If Myri decides to be patient, then he risks facing off against a power-up that he cannot beat. So overall, this Bankai is a genuinely great one, but it's held back by all of the prerequisites that are required to activate its full power. Taking the 14th spot, we have Byakya Kuchiki's Senbon Zakura Kageyoshi. Contrasted against its regal beauty is its devastating might, making it both breathtaking and very deadly. Despite its apparent simplicity, this Bankai brings a lot to the table. It manifests a 
massive swarm of small pink blades that resemble cherry blossoms. Byakuya's ability to control and direct these small fragments grants him deadly versatility. Because he can utilize these blades offensively and even defensively, they are so sharp that it's almost impossible to block them, and the sheer number of them makes them unavoidable for most, and when clustered together, they form an almost impenetrable barrier. Now, the incredible feats of this Bankai don't just end here. If the first swarm of blades somehow isn't enough to finish off an opponent, Byakuya is able to activate an aspect of his Bankai that doubles down on his offensive power. This is called Senkei, where all of the small blades condense down into actual swords that are arranged in overlapping circles floating above each other. The swords in Senkei have even higher lethality than before, so if there's anything that Byakuya wasn't able to pierce before, he can definitely do so now. During the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Byakuya takes Senkei to an even higher level of deadliness through the use of his technique Ika Senjinka. Byakuya is able to control every single one of Senkei's blades at once, allowing him to unleash an offensive onslaught like no other. This onslaught was so unbelievably powerful that it was able to completely destroy Gerard Valkyrie's body. Semon Zakura Kageyoshi is truly a Bankai with a vast scope, and it well and truly earns its position within this ranking list. Securing the 13th place is the iconic Tensa Zangetsu. Now, of course, I am referring to Ichigo's false Bankai Tensa Zangetsu. This is a power-up that I really struggle to properly place within this ranking list, because for one reason or the other, it could come up being ranked much higher, or it could end up being ranked much lower. And after thinking of it for quite a while, I decided on placing it here, which is just above the midpoint of this ranking list, which hopefully won't cause too much controversy. To clarify, I'm not ranking this version of false Tensa Zangetsu at the peak of its power, which would obviously be after Ichigo trains to acquire the final Getsuga Tensho. I'm not factoring this in because Ichigo had lost that power long ago, and while it's a good marker for potential, it's not really relevant to the power that false Tensa Zangetsu demonstrates. Instead, I'll be focusing on Ichigo's power level before he had unlocked his true Zanbakuto abilities, because this is the best metric in order to gauge the power of his false Bankai. Tensa Zangetsu is a deceptively simple Bankai that grants its master Ichigo superhuman strength and speed. There's also an extra boost of power and speed that comes from the remainder of Ichigo's full bring and his hollow powers, which make this Bankai even more deadlier. Because with the addition of his hollow powers combined with his Bankai, it makes him even faster and even more stronger. This is what effectively grants him the power to fight and even wound Yuhobak during the first Quincy invasion. Now his speed alone in this state would allow him to easily get around almost all the abilities that are possessed by any of the Bankai that I've spoken about which are ranked below it. Tensa Zangetsu is the only Bankai shown to be capable of parrying each and every single blade from Byakuya's Bankai, not to mention the fact that he literally has a spammable nuke, which of course is his Getsuga Tensho. This combined with Ichigo's innate combat talent and his exceptional baseline strength and speed, it's more than enough to put him ahead of the curve. I purposefully placed false Tensa Zangetsu above Zenbon Zakura Kageyoshi and Mayuri's evolved Bankai because I personally believe that Ichigo is exactly the kind of raw power that can overwhelm and defeat both of these two Bankai. But considering the fact that knowledge about Ichigo's Bankai is pretty widespread, Mayuri may just have all of the knowledge that he needs in order to manifest the perfect counter against his powers. Now this is what I would say under ordinary circumstances, but you definitely do not want to underestimate Tensa Zangetsu, because this Bankai can also activate the Quincy defensive technique Blute Veen when pushed to the absolute brink. Now this might honestly be all that Ichigo needs as a new variable to throw off whatever countering force Ichigo goes up against, which is part of the reason why Mairi's evolved Bankai is ranked below it. With both incredible speed and power, false Tensa Zangetsu isn't without limitations, because it suffers from a limited moveset as well as the absence of any advanced techniques. Despite all of this, it's still a fantastic Bankai, and one that I am happy with placing at the number 13 spot. Moving on, the Bankai of Soya Azashiro, Uro Zakuro clinches the 12th spot, which makes it just shy of entering into the list of top 10 Bankai. Determining its rank was once again challenging due to its astoundingly incredible abilities, and the gap in level of Ryatsu between him and some of the other more powerful characters in the series, who boast equally as impressive Bankais to be honest. After taking everything into consideration, I think that I'm happy with its placement. To say that this Bankai is hacks central would be an understatement. It is a Bankai that grants the user the ability to merge with anything. In simple terms, he can become one with anything and then take the attributes of that thing upon himself. For example, he can become one with the air 
air and then become as intangible as thin air. It also grants him the ability to move objects almost telepathically, as well as a variety of just really interesting stuff that he can pull off. Through the power of Uro Zakuro, he's able to manifest multiple different abilities like matter manipulation, invisibility, intangibility, flight, environmental control to a limited extent, power enhancement, and to be honest, a plethora of additional abilities that could fill up the entirety of this video. Even feats of mind control are not beyond this power. Just don't ask me how this aspect works because the mechanics behind it are a bit confusing. This Bankai gives Azashiro a level of range and versatility that almost no other Zanpakuto can compete with. In case he needs to spy on an area to gain specific information, Azashiro can just merge his senses with the air, which makes it so that wherever the air is, his senses are also active. He can see, hear, and feel anything in that area. In case he needs to bind or restrict an opponent, and he doesn't feel like just using Kido, he can manipulate the ground and the walls to trap his opponent within them. If he needs a particular weapon or an object that is out of his reach, he can just manipulate and merge different objects in order to create exactly what he's looking for. Frankly, his mastery over his power is so incredible that he is one of the only characters who could use that power to escape the effects of Aizen's Kyokasuigetsu. It's just ridiculous how much Azashiro can do. The longer that I spend thinking about his powers, the more possibilities pop up into my mind as to what he can do with his Bankai. The point is that Azashiro's Bankai is really overpowered and broken, but what about its weaknesses? Due to how his ability allows him to merge with anything, this backfires on him massively when he is up against any Reishi absorbing abilities. While this is a rather niche ability amongst the Shinigami and even Hollows, it is on the other hand very common amongst the Quincy, who rely on gathering Reishi for their power. Uro Zakuro is a Bankai so impossibly broken that it's difficult to not take its abilities into consideration, even if Azashiro lacks any raw power which is comparable to some of the characters at the end game of Bleach. So we do have one more Bankai before we start talking about the top 10, and it is none other than Unahana Yachiru's Minazuki. Being the Bankai of the first Kimpachi, I wish that its true power wasn't so shrouded in mystery, but at the very least, the anime did give us a slightly clearer picture than the manga did, so we can try to work our way through how this Bankai works. From the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, Minazuki's power is demonstrated to revolve around hemokinesis, or in other words, blood manipulation. It's a Bankai that generates a massive flood of blood in an enclosed space and seemingly drenches her blade in the same blood as well. Unahana uses this blood to enhance the damage of her sword's slashes, and then she uses it to also extend the range of her sword. She is able to manipulate the blood from Minazuki to shoot a literal waves of blood at her opponents. The anime also shows us that the power of Minazuki grants Unahana what appears to be instant regeneration also, as she appears to heal from Kimpachi's attacks during their fight. My personal theory is that Unahana isn't just given an insane healing factor with her Bankai, but rather it grants her complete immortality to some extent. Her Bankai creates a world where her blade can reach her enemies no matter how far away they are from her. It's a world where she has no fear of dying, and she can enjoy fighting for all eternity. And fascinatingly, even her opponent seems to gain some of these advantages. This observation is rooted in the anime's depiction where after activation of her Bankai, Kimpachi no longer requires to be healed. It's also clear that when she felt that Kimpachi had grown enough to be able to kill her, she had deactivated her Bankai the moment that he had landed his final slash. And this further supports my theory that she had immortality to some extent while her Bankai was active. To be honest, that's not even what makes Minazuki great. The aspect where it truly excels in is its ability to enable Unohana to rival and at times overpower Kimpachi across various facets of combat. This is honestly a greater achievement than anything most of the Bankai that are ranked below this one have ever achieved. Heck, even Azashiro and his absurdly broken Bankai lost to a much weaker Kimpachi than the one that Unohana had faced off against. And this is not even considering the multiple buffs that Kimpachi had during his battle against Unohana. Minazuki is an incredibly powerful Bankai that is unfortunately too mysterious for us to give it a solid scaling and rank, which is why the 11th place is as high as I could have placed it on this ranking list. We've reached the top 10 Bankai and we're kicking things off with Rukia's ice cold Bankai Hakano Togame. This is a powerful Bankai that tends to get overlooked by fans. Now I'm guessing that it's probably because we only ever see it once within the manga, but I think that it's about time that we give this Bankai the recognition that it truly deserves. Through science, we have confirmed that minus 273.15 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Kelvin is the temperature at which all, and I mean all, atomic motion ceases. 
is. This is believed to be the coldest temperature that any substance can reach. It is absolute zero. Rukia's true Shikai allows her to lower her body temperature to this very level, but her Bankai truly takes this a step further. While lowering her body temperature to absolute zero, her Bankai also transforms her into an almost godlike form. Hakono Togami inverts what her Shikai does, where instead of the cold being focused within her body, the cold is sent rushing out in a mighty torrent of supernatural ice that drops the temperature of anything that it comes into contact with to absolute zero. This wave overwhelms and instantly kills anyone who's caught within its range. Unfortunately, due to the cold still affecting her body, she can't really move while she is in her Bankai form unless she wants to risk completely shattering her body. Because of this, Byakuya describes her Bankai to be extremely cruel. This is the only real weakness that this Bankai possesses, which honestly pales in comparison to the power that it grants the user. Not to mention that Rukia's limitations in moving in that state are implied to be products of her own inexperience. So this isn't even a real limitation. Instead, it highlights that this is a newly acquired Bankai, and hopefully during the Hell arc, which occurs over 10 years after the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Rukia will have had enough time to iron out some of these flaws so that she can utilize her Bankai to its fullest potential. So what actually happens to an opponent who is hit by the wave generated by Hakano Togame? Given that Absolute Zero destroys everything that it comes into contact with at an atomic level, the aftermath following an attack from this Bankai is horrifying to imagine. The real terror of this Bankai isn't just its raw power, but it's the fact that it's almost impossible to defend against unless you're able to teleport out of the location. So it doesn't matter if Rukia's opponent is really strong or durable. As long as they are made up of atoms and they are within the range of her attack, they will instantly be eradicated by it. Realistically, Rukia could eliminate almost any Bleach character if she caught them unprepared with her Bankai. The only thing that holds this fantastic Bankai back is her inexperience. But once Rukia fully masters this Bankai and she can overcome her movement restriction, there's no telling just how much insane power that she will wield. The limitless potential of Hakano Tagami is an excellent way for us to kick off the top 10 Bankai who've made it so high up on this list. Earning the ninth position is none other than Kanon Biraki Benihime Aratame, which is the Bankai that belongs to none other than Kisuke Urahara. Despite how briefly this was shown within the manga, I believe that it made a great enough statement in order to merit it being ranked so highly on this list. It possesses what is possibly the highest potential and versatility of any Bankai due to how absolutely endless the possibilities are when it comes to the application of this Bankai's power. Urahara's Bankai has the ability to restructure anything that its blade has touched. It's able to even achieve this remotely if his target is within a specified range. This power is not limited to offensive moves, like tearing adversaries apart. His Bankai is also able to heal damaged organs and even enhance Urahara's own physical form. During his battle with Askin, Urahara even leveraged this ability in order for Grimjow to make an impactful entrance into the fight. The full potential and abilities of Kanan Biraki Benihime Aratame have barely been explored within the narrative, as Kubo didn't even scratch the surface with this power. But we can connect a few dots and speculate on how his Bankai functions. Given Urahara's reputation as a brilliant scientist, many wonder how he had devised so many incredible inventions. I personally theorize that many of his inventions may be linked to his unparalleled capability to reshape anything. The way that his Bankai power is described suggests that Urahara might even be able to manipulate objects at a molecular level. This sheds a lot of light on some of the abilities that he demonstrated during his battle against Askin. One of the most interesting aspects of Urahara's Bankai power is its ability to restructure his own body. While he uses it for the rather basic purpose of a strength buff, the potential of his Bankai extends far beyond just this. Imagine if he could modify his own body in order to endure extreme temperatures like absolute zero, or render himself impervious to burns, or reduce his body's friction to evade strikes. It's not out of the realm of possibility for him to restructure his opponent's weapons by turning them into something as harmless as rubber. The defensive possibilities of this Bankai are truly endless and offensively the possibilities are equally vast. Urahara could theoretically transmute his opponents into any element that he can imagine, which would instantly kill them. He can possibly rearrange blood vessels and organs in his opponent's bodies, once again killing them instantly. Given the sheer lethal potential of Urahara's Bankai, it is understandable why he had told Chad during the Iranka arc that his Bankai isn't suited for training others. Because his Bankai is essentially a weapon of instant annihilation, as it earns the title of being one of the most dangerous Bankai in the entire series. 
Kanons. While we may not have seen that much of Kanon Biraki Banihime Aratame, the sheer implications of its abilities solidify its place within the top 10 best Bankai in the series. If we get to see this Bankai again and further information is revealed about it, it could easily earn itself a higher spot in this ranking. Next up, in 8th place, we have Shunsui Kyoraku's Theatre of Death Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju. This Bankai earns the reputation of being a one of a kind wonder due to how complex and interesting its abilities are. It elevates its Shikai abilities to dramatic new heights. As one would expect from an exceptional Bankai, it transforms the surroundings into a theatrical three act play, dragging both Shunsui and his opponent into a series of compelling scenarios. Essentially, Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju personifies the saying, The world is a stage, before proceeding to thrusting its powers and abilities onto everybody else. The first act of this play involves the affliction of an unspecified disease on Shunsui's target. Because of the fast pace in which we progress from one act to the other, we don't really get an in depth understanding of how the illness that he afflicts onto his opponent works. I guess you could chalk it up to Shunsui bestowing a severe spiritual affliction upon his opponents. The next act of Shunsui's Bankai reflects all of his wounds onto his opponent's body. If the first act wasn't enough to defeat the opponent, then Shunsui's own battle damage is there in order to amplify the effects of Act 1. The third act, which is the second to last act, engulfs both of the combatants in a vast aquatic expanse, which guarantees that neither of them can escape until they run out of spiritual pressure and die. In hindsight, when you look at the first two acts, I feel like they exist simply to give Shunsui a head start for Act 3, which I honestly find really funny. The fourth and final act of this Bankai is an instant kill technique, as it materializes a slender white thread that wraps itself around the enemy's neck, as this thread not only slices the throat, but it pretty much causes his target's head to explode off of their neck in one of the most dramatic ways possible. It sure is a dramatic way to end his theatrical play. But all of the flowery talk aside, what does this Bankai really do? Well, it creates an alternative dimension where the only rules that matter are the rules that are set by Karamatsu Shinju. It negates any powers that would prevent its progression through its acts, which is why even Lil Barrow, a character who should be completely intangible, can still take damage and be harmed by the effects of Shunsui's Bankai. This means that his Bankai can just turn off the abilities of his opponents and force them to obey his rules. Combined with the incredibly high spiritual pressure of Shunsui, there's almost no one in the entire series who can resist the effects of his Bankai. Which is why Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju comfortably earns the 8th spot on this ranking list. This brings us to the number 7th best Bankai in Bleach. Now this is one that had almost made it into the top 5, but after a ton of consideration, I feel like giving it the 7th spot is the best place for it. This is the hellish Bankai Zanka no Tachi belonging to none other than Head Captain Gen Ryusai Yamamoto. Now I know that some of you would have expected me to place this higher up in the rankings, so before you all go raging in the comments, hear my explanation out. Zanka no Tachi is a Bankai that needs no introduction. It is literally the peak of all fire abilities within the Bleach universe. Its ferocity is not just any ordinary heat. We're talking about a staggering 15 million degrees, which is equivalent to the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. His Bankai kicks off by coating himself and his Zanpakuto with these intense fiery flames. He also possesses the chilling ability to summon the charred skeletal remains of every single individual that is being killed by his Zanpakuto, as they rally alongside him in order to fight for him. There's a potential that corpses in the number of the trillions could end up emerging. I guess this serves as a grim reminder that this lovely old man has probably the greatest body count in all of history. If his resurrected skeletal army isn't enough, Yamamoto has another trick up his sleeve and it's a unique slash that concentrates all of his scorching flames into a singular devastating strike, which is a surefire way of annihilating his enemy. Quite rightly, you may be wondering, with such overwhelming power, why is it only in the 7th spot? When I mentioned that the Bankai rankings would be based on a mix of Reatsu and Bankai capabilities, I meant that the balance between these two factors would dictate the Bankai's position on this ranking list. In the case of Zankai no Tachi, its hellish powers, while impressive, don't quite measure up to the sheer might and unique abilities of the Bankais that surpass it on this ranking list. There's a possibility that even if Zankai no Tachi held superior Reatsu, other Bankais could counteract it with their distinctive skills. Conversely, if Zankai no Tachi had better abilities, the sheer Reatsu force of some of the other Bankais could nullify and overpower it. As we're now getting closer into the top 5 Bankai, I'm going to keep coming back to compare them to Zankai no Tachi 
Hachi, as I'll be using this Bankai as a benchmark for my comparisons. Moving on, in the 6th position we have the unnamed Bankai of Kimpachi Zaraki. There have been several mysterious Bankai that we've spoken about on this list, but I think that one of the most peculiar ones has to be Kimpachi's. There seems to be a trend amongst the lineage of Kimpachi's where their Bankai transformations have left fans scratching their heads in suspense. This tradition amongst the holders of the Kimpachi title was initiated by Unohana, whose Bankai Minazuki had also left us with many questions about the exact mechanics behind the abilities that she demonstrates in her Bankai form. We do know one thing for certain when it comes to Kimpachi Zaraki's Bankai. This demonic transformation elevates his tremendous strength to levels beyond comprehension. I mean, it's mind-boggling when considering that his Shikai already amplifies his power immensely. We are briefly introduced to his Bankai during Kimpachi's battle against Gerard Valkyrie. He was battling against an enemy who was strong enough to defeat the insane power of his Shikai. This resulted in Kimpachi awakening a power that completely overturned the tide of the battle. It gave him the power to overwhelm and casually kill Gerard. And from what we find out a few pages later, this doesn't even scratch the surface of the full potential of Kimpachi's Bankai. This is quite a similar situation to Rukia's Bankai as Kimpachi's body begins to collapse because of the sheer amount of power that his Bankai possesses, meaning that his inexperience is the limiting factor when it comes to his Bankai. While this Bankai doesn't possess any of Zanka no Tachi's insane heat hacks, it does however surpass Yamamoto's Bankai in almost every other aspect. In terms of raw Reatsu, Bankai State Kimpachi dwarfs both Lloyd and Hashward, both of whom had previously managed to withstand his presence. I'd even argue that Kimpachi in his elevated state held more Reatsu than the version of Yohobak who ended up defeating Yamamoto. This was Yohobak who had claimed that he could effortlessly absorb all of Yamamoto's power. There's a rather insane scaling chain all the way from Kimpachi's battle with Unohana that weaves through his fight with Grammy and ends at his battle against Gerard that creates a massive power gap between Zanka no Tachi's Reatsu output against the Reatsu output of Kimpachi's Bankai. The gap between the two is so pronounced that it's hard to rank Zanka no Tachi's unique abilities over the raw power that Kimpachi's Bankai possesses. So we've finally reached the top 5 and coming in the 5th place is another mysterious Bankai which is the true Bankai of Tensa Zangetsu belonging to our protagonist Ichigo Kurosaki. It's an extremely controversial Bankai for quite a number of reasons that I can't possibly get into in this video but I do have a separate video covering my thoughts on Ichigo's true Bankai where I speculate and theorize about its power in great detail. The true Bankai version of Tensa Zangetsu is a Bankai that's similar to Ichigo's false Bankai in the sense that it also grants him incredible speed and power. There are however some hints that suggest that true Tensa Zangetsu harbors a hidden power and it's one that Ichigo hasn't really demonstrated yet. This power was so great that it terrified Yuhobak who had awakened the Almighty and was empowered by the power of the Soul King, meaning that this ability was so formidable that it made the most formidable entity in the Bleach universe anxious to go up against the true power of Tensa Zangetsu. Out of caution, Yuhobak ended up breaking his Bankai in the future before Ichigo ever got a chance to even use it. I know most of us like to hammer on this moment as one of the greatest disappointments in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but looking at it inversely, it's low-key one of the greatest power showcases in the entire story. Being fans of shonen battle manga, who doesn't like to see a really strong character beat up another really strong character with an all-new power-up? Just take a second to imagine how absolutely cold it is to scare a knight omnipotent god so much that he just decides to avoid fighting you and he then negates your power in the future. This is easily one of the greatest sidesteps in the history of shonen anime and manga. Even after Yuobak had shattered his Bankai, a gravely injured Ichigo had ended up activating his Bankai once again thanks to the help of Orihime and Tsukishima. True, Tenzal Zangetsu was so formidable that it managed to defeat Yuhobak not once but twice. No other character or Bankai in the Bleach universe boasts such an accolade. Furthermore, based on these achievements, we can infer that Ichigo's true Bankai amplifies Ichigo's Reatsu to staggering levels. In summary, ranking the true Bankai of Ichigo in the fifth spot is well justified. How do we witness the full spectrum of true Tenzal Zangetsu's capabilities, he could have easily earned the number one spot on this list. The fourth best Bankai in all of Bleach, in my opinion, is Shuhei Hisagi's Fushi no Kojio. Now don't click off the video just yet, hear me out. You have heard me go on and on throughout this video talking about how multiple Bankai are saved by either their hacks or the Reatsu of their users, and how one can carry the other in how powerful the Bankai ends up becoming. While Fushi no Kojio has an extremely powerful ability that absolutely negates the need for Reatsu. You could even say that the power
because of Hisagi's Bankai work best when he fights enemies who completely outclass him in Reatsu and overall power. This Bankai enables Hisagi to create a world of stagnation, where nobody can die. He does this by creating a massive ball of chains that bind both Hisagi and his opponent. From what we can gather, these chains are unavoidable and they can't be removed or broken off when they're attached. The chains create a combined pool of both Hisagi and his opponent's Reatsu, and as the two fight, any injuries that are sustained between the two of them will be healed immediately using Reatsu from this said pool. Even fatal injuries are healed instantly with this power. It leaves absolutely no room for injury or death. The Can't Fear Your World light novels describe Hisagi's Bankai as one that rewrites the very reishi of the space that it influences. It essentially creates a pocket dimension where none of the rules of the current world apply. This Bankai was used against the formidable hybrid being Hikone, who pretty much outclassed Hisagi on every level. Yet this massive power gap between them is exactly what made this ability so effective in Hisagi's favour. The only real limitation that comes with the power of Fushi no Kojio is that there's no real way to win in a fight with this Bankai. It will still mate literally anyone that it goes up against and it's a far more impressive outcome than losing in a fight. For example, if Yamamoto were to go up against Fushi no Kojio, he would still end up in a stalemate with Hisagi no matter what technique that he uses, because the same Reatsu empowering his attacks is what would end up restoring Hisagi back to life. While Hisagi's Bankai does grant him and his opponent with some form of immortality, it does not however negate the pain that is associated with having your body destroyed and restored over and over again. Having to endure all of this may be just a bit too mind-bending for us to imagine. Despite all of this, Hisagi is still unable to lose to anyone with his Bankai, which is why I've placed Fushi no Kojo in the fourth spot ranking above of all of the other Bankai that I've spoken about thus far. While this is a very contentious decision, what I want to draw all of your attention on is the Bankai that rank above this one. These are the transformations who have earned the top 3 spot in my ranking list. It took a while but we're in the end game of this ranking list and the Bankai that I believe to be the third most powerful one in the entire series belongs to none other than Toshiro Hitsugaya and it's his mature Daiguren Hyorinmaru. This may sound extremely controversial but I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can, as I'll start by going over the abilities that this matured version of his Bankai exhibits. Hitsugaya's fully matured Bankai retains its ability to manipulate ice and it builds upon this by taking it up a whole new level. The first and most notable thing about this new version of Daiguren Hyorinmaru is how it freezes enemies. It doesn't shoot torrents of ice anymore, it instead manifests ice around the opponents instantly, essentially granting Hitsugaya the ability to flash freeze his opponents. This enhances his range and versatility greatly and it grants him much more micro control over his attacks, which is to be honest always a great thing to have. But the real kicker in this equation is that Hitsugaya's ice now possesses the ability to completely halt the function of whatever it encases, both autonomically and supernaturally. This is what he had used to destroy Gerard's sacred sword Hofnung, which had powers tied to the concept of hope. Hitsugaya froze it and explained that even his hope has been frozen, proving that not only super natural abilities are at the mercy of his freezing power, but even abilities with conceptual roots can be halted by him. So concepts like balance demonstrated by Hashward would also be at the mercy of Hitsugaya's matured Bankai. There is also another impressive feat that this matured Bankai has that none of the other Shinigami in Bleach have. It's that Hitsugaya would be the only Shinigami who would be able to easily counter Hisagi's Bankai. This is due to the fact that once he freezes the surroundings, including Hisagi's chains, the chains will consequently lose their physical and supernatural functions, and considering that he can literally freeze concepts, he can freeze and negate the stagnation that is created by Hisagi's Bankai. While in his matured Bankai state, Hitsugaya can defend himself by flash freezing any enemy who is dumb enough to touch him in this state. He possesses a technique called Shikai Hyoketsu, which allows him to freeze any and all matter, even raw energy, as long as his opponent moves four times. This also adds to the fact that not only is he freezing and negating powers, he is also freezing at absolute zero temperatures, which literally means that he has an enhanced version of Rukia's Bankai Hakano Togami, but it's much better in several aspects. The abilities possessed by Hitsugaya's enhanced Bankai are insanely powerful, but we know that having a powerful ability isn't all that it takes to be a top dog in this ranking list. So does the level of Reatsu that is possessed by adult Hitsugaya hold up in this Bankai state? The best and most easy way to scale this would be having to compare him
him to his opponent Gerard Valkyrie. Before Hitsugaya activates the enhanced Daiguren Hyorin Maru, Gerard had already significantly gotten more powerful. Then when Kimpachi had arrived and started fighting Gerard, they were evenly matched. But unfortunately, Kimpachi's attacks just kept making Gerard stronger. And the situation was made even worse after Kimpachi had activated his Bankai. Kimpachi added on the monstrous strength of his Bankai to the equation, as Gerard had used this power to once again evolve. This creates a monster with power surpassing the version of Kimpachi's Bankai that we had just seen. It is this version of Gerard that Hitsugaya completely and absolutely disrespects in his fight. He fought and defeated an enemy who had taken up a portion of Kimpachi's Bankai strength and had turned it into his own, but it still wasn't enough to harm Hitsugaya. This implies that mature Daiguren Hyorin Maru also grants Hitsugaya an insane Reatsu boost, allowing him to go toe to toe with some of the most godly entities in the Bleach universe. So, with the combination of high Reatsu and insane abilities, this is why I believe that the complete version of Hitsugaya's Daiguren Hyorin Maru is the third best Bankai in the entire series. So, we're in the final two, and coming in second place is a Bankai that I would have never believed that I'd be ranking in this video. This Bankai is, of course, the great weaver Senjumaru Shutara's Shitatsu Karagara Shigarami no Suji. Its immense power is shrouded in mystery, but we have more than enough information to help us piece together its true potential. This is a Bankai that allows Senjumaru to create a massive loom that is able to create beautiful textiles. Now, this doesn't sound very threatening when you word it like this, but these textiles that she creates specifically are designed to fit the opponent that she is facing. So, whatever cloth that her loom weaves will be designed specifically in order to counter the abilities of the enemy that she is up against. Her Bankai manipulates fate itself, as it produces any element that it requires in order to counter the powers of her opponents. Delving deeper into her Bankai, it takes the tailor concept to an extraordinary level. Just as a tailor crafts specific garments to fit an individual's body, her Bankai weaves textiles which are specifically designed as an exact counter to any of her opponent's abilities. Its versatility is remarkable, as it can counter numerous intricate abilities at the same time. For instance, she had conjured an eight-sided mirror room reflecting any attacks back to its origin in order to counter Lil Barrow's formidable X-axis. Moreover, she had crafted specialized textiles to neutralize the powers of individual Shootstarfel members. Each textile is specifically tailored to trap, immobilize, or even neutralize its intended target in a variety of ways, like sealing Askin in a textile that functions very much like an Iron Maiden. She seals Hashward in a room that will burn him eternally until he turns to ash. She seals Gerard in a textile that freezes him so he's not only immobilized, but isn't receiving any damage from an attack which will consequently make him stronger. She also demonstrates burying Pernida alive in a textile which is filled with surfaces that he cannot manipulate or destroy with his nerves. And lastly, she seals Uryu in a textile that drains his life and energy. Senjumaru's Bankai doesn't fall behind her incredible powers either. She's easily one of the most powerful Shinigami to have ever lived. Her Bankai's spiritual pressure alone can endanger the three realms. So even when she's using her Bankai, she has to be extra careful so as to not destroy the universe in the process. This basically removes any possibility of Reatsu negation when it comes to fighting against her power. She's an insanely powerful Shinigami with an equally powerful Bankai, and her ability to write the fates of her opponents is easily the most broken Bankai ability that we have ever seen. Or at least it's definitely the second most broken because we've got one final Bankai to speak about. Coming in in the number one position is a Bankai that most of you may have already guessed as I'm about to talk about the Bankai of none other than Manako Osho as it's his time to shine as the mightiest Bankai in all of Bleach is reserved for none other than Ichibe Yosube and his Bankai called Shinuchi. It is however a power that doesn't make a lot of sense without adding the context of his Shikai to the situation. Ichibe's Shikai grants him the ability to erase the name of whatever the ink from his blade splashes onto. This ability doesn't just erase a name from existence, it erases it along with everything that is tied to it. This includes one's entire identity, powers, and almost every representation of who they were before the ink had even touched them. This leaves them nameless, powerless, and defenseless. This is where his Bankai, or rather, his Shinuchi comes in. One of the cool things about this Bankai is that it's so old that its existence predates the word Bankai. It was the first ever evolved Zanpakuto in the entire history of Bleach, and when you look at the abilities, it's made very apparent that this Bankai played a major part in shaping the history of 
the Bleach universe. Shinuchi grants Ichibei the ability to grant a new name to anyone whose name had been erased by the ink of his Shikai. This new name comes with all the traits and attributes that are associated with this said name. So if he names the target frog, then they will gain the speed, power and intelligence of a frog. All they previously were is erased and their entire existence is boiled down to frog. This is basically a broken power that Ichibei can use to pretty much nope any power out of existence. Because this is the oldest Bankai in existence, the story subtly hints that Ichibei's abilities may resonate on the same extraordinary plane of transcendence like Dangai Ichigo and Hokyoku infused Aizen. While it isn't explicitly stated within the manga, it is kind of implied that Ichibei's Bankai goes beyond the idea of Reatsu, which is why even Yuhobak wasn't able to sense any Reatsu from this incredible Bankai transformation. This means his Bankai's power might not even be tied to Reatsu like other abilities in Bleach. So it exists because it's tied to the very fabric of the Bleach reality. And the only person who rivals the power of this Bankai is literally the mightiest being in existence, the Soul King. I doubt that we're ever going to see a Bankai that rivals the level of power of Shinuchi, cementing it as the power ceiling for all Bankai, which is only appropriate because this Bankai is wielded by the leader of all of the Shinigami after all. Well, that was it. That's my ranking of every single Bankai that's ever been revealed within the Bleach manga or the anime. I wasn't expecting this video to hit over the one hour mark, so if any of you are still watching, then you have my eternal gratitude. A very important part of these videos is getting all of you involved in the conversation, so don't hesitate to let me know if you disagree with some of my placements in this ranking list. I've tried to justify to the best of my ability why each Bankai has earned its position on this list, and after all, this is just my opinion. So from all of these 30 Bankai that I've spoken about, let me know your personal rankings for the very best Bankai ranked from the weakest all the way up to the strongest. I look forward to reading all of your thoughts and once again, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. It was a really long one and I'm looking forward to making more ranking lists in the future. And lastly, thanks for making it to the end of this video and I cannot wait to see you in my next Bleach video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.